Deepak Singh is the Director of Compute Services at AWS, where he works on cloud products relating to containers, Linux, and high-performance computing. In today's show, Deepak describes how the market for containers and serverless has evolved, and how Amazon thinks about product strategy. Back in 2014, Docker containers were becoming a popular way to deploy and manage application infrastructure. Containers allowed people to take advantage of their servers in a more economical way. Containers let developers move faster by quickly setting up and tearing down small composable units of software. As these containers grew in number within software companies, these companies started figuring out that they needed tooling to manage and orchestrate all these containers. Infrastructure software companies realized that there would be a big business in providing orchestration software to developers who needed to manage these high volumes of containers. This led to the Container Orchestration Wars, in which a variety of companies such as CoreOS, Red Hat, Docker, Mesosphere, and several others, all began to offer platforms for managing containerized applications. During the Container Orchestration Wars, many large enterprises such as banks and telcos resisted picking any specific container orchestration system because there was no clear winner. Enterprises were hesitant to place a large bet on an infrastructure orchestration tool that might go out of fashion. Amazon had a large number of customers that wanted to orchestrate their containers, but it was unclear how the market for open source container orchestration was going to unfold. And around this time, Amazon created ECS, a closed source container orchestration system. In the following years, Kubernetes was released and became the most popular container orchestration system. Amazon released EKS, a managed Kubernetes service, and they also released AWS Lambda for running serverless functions and AWS Fargate for spinning up long-lived container instances. Deepak and I discuss the history of containers at Amazon, but we also discuss how developer preferences are changing towards managed services and how AWS is able to continually build off of its own tools to build higher and higher level services for developers. Software Engineering Daily is looking for sponsors. If you are interested in reaching over 50,000 developers, you can go to softwareengineeringdaily.com slash sponsor to find out more. You can send us a message there. We'd love to hear from you. And if you're an engineer working at a company that is marketing to developers, or if you're hiring developers, you can tell your marketing department or your recruiting department about softwareengineeringdaily.com slash sponsor. It's one way to help us out, but your listenership is quite enough assistance. Thanks, as always, for listening, and let's get on with the show. Data holds an incredible amount of value, but extracting value from data is difficult, especially for non-technical, non-analyst users. As software builders, you have a unique opportunity to unlock the value of data to users through your product or service. Jaspersoft offers embeddable reports, dashboards, and data visualizations that developers love. Give users intuitive access to data in the ideal place for them to take action within your application. To check out Jaspersoft, go to softwareengineeringdaily.com slash Jaspersoft and find out how easy it is to embed reporting and analytics into your application. Jaspersoft is great for admin dashboards or for helping your customers make data-driven decisions within your product because it's not just your company that wants analytics, it's also your customers that want analytics. Jaspersoft is made by Tibco, the software company with two decades of experience in analytics and event processing. In a recent episode of Software Engineering Daily, we discussed the past, present, and future of Tibco, as well as the development of Jaspersoft. In the meantime, check out Jaspersoft for yourself at softwareengineeringdaily.com slash Jaspersoft. Thanks to Jaspersoft for being a sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. Deepak Singh, you are the Director of Compute Services at Amazon Web Services. Welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Hi, thank you for having me. You've been at AWS for more than 10 years, and you've covered a lot of different uh, areas of Amazon Web Services. 
Today, you're focused on compute services and containerization. And I'd like to get some historical context for how you see the world of containers today. So when Docker started getting heavily adopted by technology companies, which was maybe four years ago, five years ago, how did that affect the product strategy at AWS? I think you've heard us say quite often that we like starting off with a customer and working backwards. And it was about, I'd say, late 2014 that we started hearing a lot of customers ask us about, could you build us a service to manage Docker? And initially, you know, it was an interesting question. You could run Docker on EC2. But we started digging in and we were trying to figure out what customers wanted to achieve and why. And not surprisingly, it boiled down to a couple of areas. One was, as people scaled the use of Docker up, they were running into the same problems that one would if you were scaling up VMs, except you were scaling much faster, uh, you were writing applications a little differently. And so it gave us a sense of how applications were changing. We'd already seen this with people like Netflix and other customers who were doing many of the same things with things like the JVM. But now you had this other artifact and it became pretty clear to us that we needed to start thinking about orchestration for containers specifically and containerized applications and that it wasn't just about managing VMs anymore. So the from a strategy perspective, the biggest change was it wasn't enough for us to say, hey, you can run Docker on EC2. We needed to build something first class that was an AWS API. And that's because when people were starting to use Docker, there were a lot of different ways that people were utilizing it. You had Chef and Puppet scripts being written to spin up these containers, and you had this imperative logic, and then you had some systems like Mesos, which helped you with container orchestration. I guess you had the HashiCorp suite of technologies that were helping people set stuff up. But there was certainly a feeling in the containerization community around this time that something was missing, that this was not the end state of containerization. And that's what manifested in the container orchestration wars, these open source container orchestrators that came out, like Mesos and eventually Kubernetes. And Amazon didn't pick any of the open source orchestrators until later on, until the EKS, the Kubernetes service, came out. Amazon released ECS, which was not explicitly one of the open source containerization providers. What was the strategy behind that decision, and how were you thinking about the container orchestrator wars? So, you know, 2014 was an interesting time. There wasn't really that much out there. Mesos had some container support, but not that much. There was a, you know, hopscotch of tools out there that people had started building to address the container problem. We did have one thing. Customers had been running on EC2 for a very long time. We had a good sense of what our customers were asking for. Specifically, they wanted a container orchestration system that had first-class integration with things like ALB, with IAM, with security groups, had auto-scaling as a core concept. So for us, the main thing that we set out to do when we built ECS was our customers are asking us for a specific set of things that they want to do. They want to do it in an AWS context. So how can we build a service that is effectively an EC2-like service that gives you many of the same capabilities, but with orchestration as a first-class concept? Uh, And that's where ECS came from. And we looked at what was out there at the time, and it became pretty clear that we needed to start from the ground up. Were you able to also look at the needs of internal customers within Amazon? Because obviously you're at AWS, so you have a certain perspective on what developers want because you're just dealing with customers all the time. There are plenty of developers who spin up infrastructure on AWS, but there are also developers within Amazon that are developing applications within the company, and I'm sure some of them were on the bleeding edge and using Docker, maybe some of them were not. How did the internal use cases for containers contrast with what you were seeing in the customer base of startups and other companies that were using AWS at the time? One of the nice things is we do get the advantage of working with Amazon Teams, just like we do with other large customers, and they have their own set of problems. I would say that 
at the time, it was kind of interesting. We had customers that you would expect, small startups who wanted to run fast. But we also had a bunch of larger companies with established infrastructures who were looking at containers very seriously. And Amazon Teams fall into that category. I think what you get out of them is they have very strong notions and expectations around operational excellence. So it was very important for us to have ECS support scale and the ability to operate at a, you know for an internet scale service right from day one. Uh, I think that's where the needs of not just internal teams, but our larger internet customers drove us from the beginning. And when you, when you think about today, how do the challenges of containerization today differ if we're talking about a single developer versus a small startup versus a large enterprise? Because these different tiers of software engineering, they develop or they adopt containers for different reasons. That's right. In fact, that's part of the fun. I, I think I'll go back to where our customers were when we started and what we see today. I think that'll help answer this question. Three, four years ago, our customers fell into two or three categories. There were folks who were using Docker for deployments. That's your classic container use case. I can package up my application, I can put it in a pipeline and use it as an artifact. Very quickly, customers started using containers for batch jobs. Uh, that's an easy transition. You are again using it more as an execution system. And it became so popular that we ended up launching a service, AWS Batch, just for that use case. But about a year or so in what people call microservices today, I always put air quotes around it, basically decoupled applications became the majority of what we saw. And the sophistication and complexity of this, of these applications has continued to evolve. Three years ago, an application might be 10 services, 20. Now we see some customers with hundreds of services in a single application. But perhaps more recently, what you've started seeing is customers looking at line of business applications, these enterprises, and trying to figure out where containers fit in. And that's a very different customer, very different use case. So our challenge is, how do we support all of them? And should we? And how do we do that? And much of our roadmap today is trying to figure out how to balance all of these use cases. So when an enterprise decides to adopt containerization, what does that actually mean? What do they need to do to containerize those applications? Because, I mean, we, obviously we talk about, we've done a lot of shows about modernization and, you know, moving the monolith to to microservices and, and getting things into containers. What are the finer points of that migration that are perhaps harder to do than uh, than people recognize? What are the things that get glossed over? Quite honestly, I think the number one thing that gets glossed over, and this is thinking about modern applications, is that your container orchestrator is just a piece of the puzzle. You need governance, you need networking, you need policy management, you need a whole ecosystem around it. And I think one of the things that people tend to forget is you do need all of those and you get married to, oh my, here are the features that my container orchestration system has. And that works great to get off the ground. But when you're actually in an enterprise, you have to think about all the other things. Uh, so I think that's the number one lesson that people learn when they start off. Uh, or some of them lucky, luckily will do it from the first day, but many learn it the hard way. I think the second part, is there's a class of applications that you probably are not going to convert into a microservice. Uh, the person who wrote it may be in a corner office now and barely remembers how to code, or maybe it's just not worth the effort. Question then becomes, can I find all the dependencies and can I safely containerize it so that you can potentially run it on a place like AWS? And we run into that more and more often now. Mm. And so what do people, so you're describing the situation where you have this black box service within your enterprise and maybe the developer who wrote the service is gone. They don't work at the company anymore. There's no tests around this service. It's impossible to update and yet everybody depends on it. So what are the challenges of modernizing that piece of infrastructure? Yeah, first one is finding dependencies, like what depends on it? How does it depend? What does this app depend on? I think what people have started doing is trying to see if there's a core of the app that they don't have to touch and then trying to make changes around that application. So anything new, anything that they're writing on top of it is written as a modern application. But this little black box service that's probably best left alone 
once they can figure out the dependencies, they just lock it in and keep it that way. And that's what I see customers doing a lot these days. By dependencies, you mean services that depend on this service. That's correct. Okay. There are a, a range of ways that people can deploy their containers. People can manage their own Kubernetes cluster. They could do it on bare metal. They could do it on VMs. They could use a container service like ECS. They could use a Kubernetes service like EKS, which have the ECS and EKS have different APIs. They can use standalone containers like you have Fargate. Can you give some mappings between the customer use cases and some of these different container deployment choices? Yeah, the place we start always is if you can use a serverless system, and I'll put Fargate in that category, start there. It significantly reduces the operational overhead, makes things a lot faster. Things like bin packing or how you spread things out, you don't have to worry about that. And really, you shouldn't have to. Along with that, you probably want to use other managed services uh, for databases and analytics. So that's the starting point. If you can do it, you can make it work. That's the best way forward. Then you start peeling back. Maybe you have a, you want to use spot instances. Some of our customers use spot instances heavily. There you'll want to run on something like EKS or ECS running on your own EC2 instances. That's the second step. And then you basically start peeling back from there. How much, what are the right abstractions for your application? How much governance and control do you want to put in place or depend on and have too much to change to move to a serverless system? And that's, and of course, the ultimate one there is get a bunch of bare metal EC2 instances and then run your own orchestration and your own management. But that's close to unheard of at this point of time. A thank you to our sponsor, Datadog, a cloud monitoring platform bringing full visibility to dynamic infrastructure and applications. Create beautiful dashboards, set powerful machine learning-based alerts, and collaborate with your team to resolve performance issues. You can start a free trial today and get a free t-shirt from Datadog by going to softwareengineeringdaily.com slash datadog. Datadog integrates seamlessly with more than 200 technologies, including Google Cloud Platform, AWS, Docker, PagerDuty, and Slack. With fast installation and setup, plus APIs and open source libraries for custom instrumentation, Datadog makes it easy for teams to monitor every layer of their stack in one place. But don't take our word for it. You can start a free trial today, and Datadog will send you a free t-shirt. Visit softwareengineeringdaily.com slash datadog to get started. Thank you to Datadog. What are those use cases where people need spot instances and they need a managed Kubernetes service versus a serverless service like Fargate or like a serverless Lambda function? Yeah, it, it boils down to economics. Uh, spot instances give you very good pricing. And if you have an app that's not time sensitive, that you can put on a schedule which says, when the price is right, run these applications for me. Uh, there's a bunch of our customers who do that. Uh, they have become very sophisticated at using spot instances running across instance types to get the best scale and pricing. Uh, but you have to be able to use something that's interruptible. And if you can do that, then Spot works really, really well. So I guess the pricing differences there, you're even going to have better pricing than uh, AWS Lambda because if somebody is requesting to call a Lambda function, there is this cold start question, but you do have some guarantees around when your function is going to get executed so it's not going to necessarily wait around for off hours and get the absolute best pricing. Uh, you're going to, if you execute a AWS Lambda function at peak AWS overall time, then you're going to get worse pricing than spot instance pricing. Yeah, a different way of saying it is we haven't brought a spot-like model to Fargate and Lambda yet. While EC2, we have one and it works really, it gives you really good pricing. What about Fargate versus the serverless Lambda functions? 
How do the use cases between those two options differ? That's probably one of the most fun questions I get to answer. Some of it depends on how your apps are written. If you have an app that was written as a long-running service in, say, JVMs, for example, and you don't want to re-implement it as serverless Lambda functions, which requires some rethinking of your programming model, then Fargate's great. You don't need to change that much. It'll work very much the same way. And that works very well for a lot of customers. There are other customers that may want to write in a language that may not be ideal for Lambda or have services that last, that run forever and ever. Uh, Lambda has some specific limitations. But if you can rethink your application as Lambda functions, you can think through the limitations on time, you should absolutely use that as your first choice. It's low friction. You can scale really nicely, operate it really well. So we see customers making those choices. Most often, what we see them do is break their apps up and some portions of them may be running in Lambda and some portions of the apps might be running in something like Fargate. I actually operate a service, AWS Batch, which is a mix of API gateway, Lambda functions, and containers. And it works pretty nicely. The ECS service came out before the container orchestration wars were resolved. And I think in retrospect, it actually looks like a pretty good decision because you didn't couple the Amazon container orchestrator strategy to any of the container orchestrators that were duking it out in these container orchestration wars. But then the Kubernetes emerged as the quote-unquote winner of the container orchestration wars, and there was a hunger for a managed Kubernetes service, so you released EKS, which is Amazon's Kubernetes service. Are there market differences between ECS and EKS today? In some ways, you know, all container orchestrators have a core set of functionality that they need to have. But I do think there are some subtle differences. I think the big one is that ECS customers really think about how things work in an AWS environment. They expect ECS to be a regional service. So as a cluster in EKS is a much more specific thing. In Kubernetes, a cluster is a specific entity. While in ECS, a cluster is more of a abstraction. You have a regional endpoint, much the way you have with EC2. But I think the bigger one is, if you're used to AWS-style APIs, things working just out of the box with the rest of AWS, and if those are the things that are important to you, ECS works really well for you. While if you like the Kubernetes APIs, you like the Kubernetes model, well, that's why we have EKS. The good news is we have both. And you know, ECS today has, what, tens of thousands of customers launching 100,000 containers every week. And that will keep, both will keep growing because the container space is just growing so much. So you still see new customers coming on to ECS and choosing that over EKS? Absolutely. I mean, I don't know if they make an explicit choice. If they like, if they're coming from EC2, they like the APIs, they're working on AWS. ECS is a very natural fit. The APIs work almost the same way. Your interaction with the rest of AWS are going to work exactly the same way. So you don't have to change your operational model. Makes sense. What are the reasons that you hear people protesting against going all in onto serverless? Because like, Speaking personally, the kind of applications I build, I want to be as serverless as possible. I want to be as abstracted away from raw infrastructure as possible because I feel like that gives me a lot of leverage. There are other people who feel a little bit uneasy about fully serverless solutions. What are the reasons that those people give? What what makes them uncomfortable about serverless? I start off by saying something, I won't call it provocative, but something I've observed. In some ways, today's cluster huggers are like server huggers from a decade ago. You get you, you get used to your cluster. How do you operate it? How do you reach, reason about it? And you're comfortable with that and you keep it. I think 80% of it is that. Now, you have some abstractions and with abstractions, you come some trade-offs. In the case of Lambda, you have a time limit. You have to rethink how you program your applications. Fargate's a little easier to reason about, but there might be people who want to tune everything about how their cluster is. They've become really, really good at taking a bunch of big instances and bin packing the living daylights out of them. And for that customer, there may be a reason to stay there. Or there's some compliance reason where the regulator says, I don't understand the serverless thing. You can't do it. So there's probably a bunch of other gray areas, but 
roughly those. How do you address when people ask you about lock-in, when they're afraid of lock-in to serverless APIs? I speak from a Fargate standpoint. I think in the end, what our customers want to do, even EKS customers, where they're using something like Kubernetes, is how can they leverage all the other things that AWS is doing? And one of our biggest tasks is to make sure that we can give them that leverage. Having said that, you're still building either with a programming language or Docker. And very often, the first order bit is your deployment pipeline. If you're using Jenkins, and that's what your developers see, what's underneath the hood almost doesn't matter. Then it boils down to how much do you want to leverage the capabilities of your cloud provider and what we give you. And that's a decision a customer has to make. We see a lot of customers who are very happy taking advantage of all the stuff that AWS is building. And there's others who want to say, okay, we'll use Kubernetes in its purest form because the flexibility it gives me. So we see both sides of the spectrum. Our goal is to make sure that we give customers the capabilities that they want. And for a lot of our customers, that means how all this other interesting stuff that AWS is doing, how can I use that too? Yeah, uh, there was a company I talked to really recently that is doing machine learning for real estate, and they built entirely on serverless. It was I, I'm sure you see a lot of companies that build entirely on serverless. And the speed that they are able to move is significantly faster than uh, what I've seen when people are choosing to manage their own infrastructure. And I mean, for many applications, it's just unquestionable that you're going to be more agile if you really double down and leverage these things like a managed database, a managed queuing system, a managed machine learning system. Are there any kinds of applications that are still quite hard to build while significantly leveraging serverless functions? I find it hard. I mean, obviously, there are probably some. And it depends on the, on the expectations of your applications. If your application expects this big, giant, shared storage array, that's going to be a little bit of a challenge. Although you, you know, But if you're building modern applications and you are delegating state to a managed database or to a managed queue, I really don't see why the vast majority of applications cannot be expressed in something like Lambda or Fargate. Obviously, we, in some ways, Lambda and Fargate are still young. They keep evolving, and we'll give you more capabilities. But for the most part, if you build with a separation of concerns, which is, I would argue, is the way it should be, then it, there's really no reason why. And when I think about the problems that you need to solve internally, to build these serverless systems so that when a customer provisions a Fargate container or a Lambda function, you need to have a container to present to them. As a cloud provider, you have a ton of scheduling challenges to implementing this kind of functionality. Take me inside the process of building scheduling systems for something like Lambda or Fargate? The great news is we got to build EC2. And EC2 is still way larger than anyone running containers on AWS, for example. And the complexity of giving people the right quality of service with things like EBS provisioned IOPS or giving people the right T3 instance with the credits, credit management that it does, that's a very vast space. So I would argue that we've built systems over the last decade that address many of these placement and scheduling challenges, which we then bring into the class container side. The difference is the units of work are different. The biggest difference between EC2 and the container world, at least, is in EC2, orchestration is done at the auto-scaling level, so at the VM machine level. While on the container side, it's much more application lifecycle oriented with tasks and pods and services. So. I think you actually have richer semantics, which make it a slightly less complex problem in many ways, except they're doing it at a much faster rate. Uh, but I would argue the systems that we've built are things that have been built as we've learned how to grow EC2 and scale it. And we bring those lessons to things like Fargate and Lambda. And obviously, we learn new lessons along the way, which you bring in. That includes building new backend technologies, the backend data store that ECS uses was built because of all the lessons we learned scaling EC2 and what we needed to manage that. That's a good example of where we learn 
And there's many other systems that we've built over the years or rebuilt because we had to take EC2 from where it was 12 years ago to where it is today. That backend data store, is that something that manages the locks on these different container instances and makes sure that these things are not over-provisioned and prevents noisy neighbor problems? Is it things like that? It's, it's basically a data store that, that monitors all the transactions in a system. In the case of ECS, it's all the transactions in a region across all the clusters and containers uh, tasks that we manage. And it gives us a very good uh, insight into the heat, heat of the system. Are we doing the right thing in terms of giving our customers the right quality of service? And it allows us to do interesting things in making sure that we can keep scaling uh, while limiting impact if something bad happens. I think that last thing is probably the thing we focus on most. How do we make sure that we minimize the impact of something going wrong in the system, which it does? And many ways of we, the way we design our backends are heavily influenced by that learning over the years. <laughs> What's an example of how that lesson was learned of minimizing damage to something going wrong during the process of scheduling and provisioning infrastructure? So you, we build availability zones for a reason. Uh, you should be able to withstand you know, zonal failure. So we work very hard to make our services zonally independent. But I think since then, we've gone one step further in trying to figure out, can we make things even in smaller and smaller units that allow us to be nimble, get scale while limiting blast radius? I think at reInvent, we might talk a little more about what we're doing here. Uh, but essentially, it boils down to how do we min- minimize the impact of, say, a dis- you know, some, an API degrading? And how do we keep it to less than an availability zone even, or maybe just a handful of clusters? And that's kind of what we work, focus on. This might be out of your purview, but is it a design constraint to have to think through how do we architect these systems so that a system-wide, an AWS-wide failure, a correlated failure between availability zones, for example, is avoided? Is that a design constraint from your point of view? So from a customer standpoint or our standpoint? From your standpoint. So from AWS, when you're architecting these kinds of systems, do you have to think, okay, we cannot have correlated failures of the ECS scheduling infrastructure between different availability zones because the world relies on AWS? Oh, absolutely. Those are the kinds of things we think about a lot. Uh, And we keep learning new lessons as we get bigger uh, and things that we can get better on. But... That's, I think, what we capture as we build uh, or re, you know, improve our services. Is what are the lessons we learn? And absolutely, correlated failure is a big one. It's one reason why we keep regions explicitly independent, uh, because some people might want to rec- run across two regions, and having that separation is, is gives them the ability to think about it in a particular way. When you say those regions run independently, because a correlated failure... It's like that could happen because someone pushes out a code change and it rolls out to all the availability zones. Then you have some bug in that code change and it brings everybody down. But at the same time, you do want to offer the same services to in those different availability zones. How do you handle that that issue? Do you just do very slow rollouts? Very careful deployments. We've learned a lot of lessons, not just at AWS, at Amazon, on what it means to deploy to many places. How do you do them safely? How do you roll back if you find something? And given that you don't notice it that often, I think we're doing an okay job. Kubernetes can be difficult. Container networking, storage, disaster recovery. These are issues that you would rather not have to figure out alone. Mesosphere's Kubernetes as a Service provides single-click Kubernetes deployment with simple management, security features, and high availability to make your Kubernetes deployments easy. You can find out more about Mesosphere's Kubernetes as a Service by going to softwareengineeringdaily.com slash mesosphere. Mesosphere's Kubernetes as a Service heals itself when it detects a problem with the state of the cluster, so you don't have to worry about your cluster going down and they make it easy to install monitoring and logging and other tooling alongside your Kubernetes cluster. With one-click install, there's additional tooling like Prometheus, Linkerd, Jenkins, and any of the services in the service catalog. 
Mesosphere is built to make multi-cloud, hybrid cloud, and edge computing easier. To find out how Mesosphere's Kubernetes as a service can help you easily deploy Kubernetes, you can check out softwareengineeringdaily.com slash mesosphere, and it would support Software Engineering Daily as well. One reason I am a big fan of Mesosphere is that one of the founders, Ben Hindman, is one of the first people I interviewed about software engineering back when I was a host on Software Engineering Radio, and he was so good and so generous with his explanations of various distributed systems concepts, and this was back four or five years ago when some of the applied distributed systems material was a little more scant in the marketplace. It was harder to find information about distributed systems uh, in production, and he was one of the people that was evangelizing it and talking about it and obviously building it in, in Apache Mesos. So I'm really happy to have Mesosphere as a sponsor, and if you want to check out Mesosphere and support Software Engineering Daily, go to softwareengineeringdaily.com slash mesosphere. So coming back to the scheduling question, when you're talking about the schedulers at the EC2 layer versus scheduling infrastructure at the container layer, you said there are a lot of learnings that you could bring from the EC2 level to the container level. That doesn't surprise me. Is there anything that doesn't map very well, like areas that you had to rethink when it came to scheduling? At least in the ECS case, uh, the best... You know, some of the lessons that we've learned, I won't talk about EC2 specifically. I think if we look at the way we give customers scheduling and placement capabilities, we have explicitly tried to take the placement and the scheduling separated. This is a, It's a two-level system. That's probably one of the lessons we learned from Mesos, which is you can express your business logic in, the, in one or more schedulers, and then the placement is handled by the service itself. The customer shouldn't have to pick a rack or an EC2 instance. They should just give you a pool of resources, but they should be able to express their business logic and potentially strategies that are hierarchical in nature, then we can then satisfy. I think the separation of concerns was definitely something that we learned through the maturation of container technologies and container orchestration. You know, it goes back to, there was this paper that was written about how Borg works and HPC schedulers versus two-level schedulers and optimistic concurrency. We learned a lot of lessons from that, and we applied them to ECS. What else did you learn from the Borg publications that came out of Google? The big one was uh, shared state and optimistic concurrency. We explicitly wanted to make our system transactional, and it was a big part of how we designed it, uh, That, as opposed to the pessimistic model that Mesos uses. Can you talk about that in more detail? I don't know too much about this uh, the pessimistic versus optimistic model and the contrasts there. Yeah, so essentially in a pessimistic model, you get offers and you select an offer, but the, you can only choose from the offers that a scheduler is given. While in a shared state, optimistically concurrent model, this, every scheduler has access to everything, the whole state of the system, and then makes a choice. Uh, which requires you to have a transactional backend. So any write changes the state of the system, and you have to read again to get the full view. So essentially that. Okay. Coming back to the world of serverless and the world of Kubernetes, there is a variety of serverless on top of Kubernetes systems. I've done interviews with at least three of them, and I'm wondering if this is if this is another space where there is competition, where there's going to be a winner in this space. It does seem like there's enough challenges in the scheduling of a serverless function against a cluster of Kubernetes instances that this, or Kubernetes, I guess you would say pods, uh, that this could be a problem where there w would be a winner. Uh, do you see this as a, as a war, kind of like the container orchestration wars? I don't know. <laughs> we see customers trying out not just on EKS, but even on Fargate, because it's kind of nice running, quote unquote, serverless system on a serverless backend. But really, 99.9% .9 of the customers we speak to are interested in Lambda from if they're doing serverless functions. And the reason is, you don't have to worry about the backend. You just write your functions. You have all these input spouts, the sources. 
you know where the data is getting piped to. And we keep working on making all of those more, giving you more and more. And you've seen the folks like the iRobot folks talk about the very sophisticated architecture they're building. And really, none of, none of them want to worry about orchestration. They just want to run their apps. So this difference between Fargate and Lambda, where Fargate today you would want to use for longer-lived services, it does seem like more of a there's more of a gradient. Like it, it, it's not explicitly like you have transient functions and then you have ones that are longer-lived. Sometimes you just don't know how long you want a function to run for. Do you think there'll be an emergence of more of a wider range of durability for the server instances between the short-lived Lambda instances and the long-lived Fargate instances? It wouldn't surprise me. Even if you take a look at how AWS Batch runs, it runs on top of ECS. That's an implementation detail. But effectively, it chooses your instances for you. It spins them up and shuts them down. And they could run for hours. As long as you have work in a queue, it'll figure out a way to execute them. And that's serverless-ish in a particular way. So I think there are gray areas. It The choice boils down to today practical uh, things, considerations. How have your, how your apps and services been written? How much control do you want on things like security groups, uh, traffic, uh, no, traffic shaping? In Lambda, you're abstracting that away and you're basically telling AWS, you got it, here are some signals. While with even with something like Fargate, you do have more control about how traffic goes from one place to another, which also means you have to think about it. And I think in, it'll be interesting to see how all this evolves over the next few years because uh, uh, we are sitting down with our customers and having the very same discussions. Now, it's gotten so much easier to write an application like a social network or even a video streaming service because you have these higher level building blocks that cloud providers are offering today. And AWS has many of those offerings. But as we're seeing, and as you're describing with AWS Batch, you also have leverage from these serverless systems that you can utilize as a cloud provider. And you can build these higher, even higher level cloud provider abstractions. So we saw this, like I said, with AWS Batch and with Amazon serverless Aurora. What are the other kinds of abstractions that, you know, when you talk to the engineers at AWS, what kinds of higher level things are we going to see built within the infrastructure provider space? That's the fun part. Like the definition of infrastructure keeps evolving as well. Um, we think of AWS as having three core compute engines, as it were. EC2, containers manifested most directly as Fargate, and then Lambda, serverless functions. And people are starting to look at what they can build using these in many, many interesting ways. Patch is one example. Machine learning, I think, is a huge one, which is, do you want to implement your own end-to-end -end machine learning system, or do you want some kind of abstraction, whether it's through something like SageMaker or an API like Recognition, as an example? Those are manifestations of abstractions that solve one or more problems. And increasingly, these are built on things like Fargate and containers and Lambda functions. Now, before you were the director of compute services, before that, you were more focused on high-performance computing. I didn't even know that Amazon had a high-performance computing department, but that doesn't surprise me. What does that term high-performance computing mean today? Like, What's the difference between HPC and people doing large Spark jobs or large MapReduce jobs? How pedantic do you want me to get? So, <laughs> <laughs> so and I come from scientific computing. But that's why I've been involved with HPC pretty much all 10 of my years here. And there's a class of people that'll say HPC explicitly means tightly coupled MPI-style applications. And that's reasonable. And when I think of HPC, I mostly think of MPI and other sort of scalable problems where you have to explicitly start thinking about things like parallelism and how do jobs depend on each other? Can two, are two nodes communicating heavily? And there's grace. You know, HPC is a very is a subset of batch in many in, in many ways, at least the way it's implemented. Most HPC people will tell you that Spark is not HPC. I think the lines are blurry. There's bandwidth considerations and things like Spark. When nodes are communicating with each other, you have to think of the same things. 
but I do think they come from a different heritage. In classic HPC, the more traditional definition, end-to-end performance becomes super important and you will trade off reliability for performance. In the data world, the Spark, Hadoop, et cetera world, you don't do that. You trade off performance for durability and resilience. HPC people are completely okay having, you know, the best example I can give is in an HPC job, it's all or nothing. You ask for 200 nodes, if you don't get them, it might as well get zero. So I think the mental models are different. The programming models are different. Machine learning makes it super interesting. So I think it's kind of in the middle. You have some of the same performance considerations, but you are building your apps in the cloud world. So you assume infrastructure that's fundamentally on demand. So I think the machine learning people will end up doing some interesting things as they evolve. Do you have any perspective on how usage of these different machine learning frameworks versus usage of a system like Spark, like a, I guess a multi-purpose resilient distributed data set system differ? Or like, what do you think is, I, we've talked so much about containers. Tell me what your perspective is on the processing, on the processing layer, the distributed processing layer. What do you think will unfold in the next couple of years? Oh, fun question. I do see containers being used a lot for machine learning across ECS, EKS, Batch, Fargate, deep learning, machine learning are heavy use cases um, and increasingly so. And I think what people are using containers here for is packaging and then the orchestration systems to, for job distribution. I, I think there's a class of enterprise data analytics where Spark is still going strong and will keep going strong. But when you're developing uh, frameworks like TensorFlow, MXNet, you know, PyTorch, all of these, I think in the ML space, at least, and I'm not you know, deep in seeing what people do, at least for my customer base on the container side and the HPC side, we see a ton of interest in all these ML DL frameworks. But I also know there's a whole bunch of people doing Spark ML and Spark analytics in the bioinformatics space, which is where I used to be before I came to Amazon. Spark is super popular. So it's not going away anytime soon. Just to wrap up, I noticed you had kind of an interesting background uh, compared to a lot of the people I talked to because you came from, I think you got a degree in analytical chemistry. So I guess you moved from chemistry research gradually into uh, scientific computing, into just computing. Can you tell me a little bit about that career transition? Yeah, it's a question I get a lot because I have uh, an interesting history. So yeah, so my PhD is in theoretical chemistry. So I'm a quantum chemist by training. And the good news with theoretical chemistry... A quantum chemist. Yeah. What is a quantum chemist? So you are trying to do things like understand the behavior of how the receptors in your eyes are interacting with light. So what gives a, makes a red cone red and what makes a blue cone blue? That's what I did my research on. But you're basically studying quantum effects of chemical systems. That's what I did. So quantum physics applied to chemical systems. And proteins are an interesting place where this happens. So I got into protein structure. And the moment you do that, you start thinking about things like protein folding and you start running uh, interesting simulations on very large supercomputers, which is how I got into scientific computing. And for the most of my PhD work was done running jobs on some supercomputer somewhere. And when I started working, it was building the software that one you would use to do pro- uh, no, drug design and protein folding, etc. So... I've always been at this intersection of computers and software, and then somehow ended up at AWS. Started off in the HPC scientific computing space, but you know, once you get involved with all the fun stuff we are doing here, I uh, got sucked in completely into infrastructure. I guess just to wrap up, maybe we could we could blend those two subjects: the chemistry side of things, the you know drug simulation side of things, uh, maybe if you have perspective on on quantum computing. But I haven't done a show on on kind of the drug modeling or the, the bio modeling space very much. Are there any like bottlenecks in data processing that are kind of gating some of these developments in chemistry or biology that we would be able to get uh, if we just had the compute resources to to simulate them? I think so. in some ways, GPUs have made a huge impact. And the kind of computing you can do with GPUs is super interesting, especially in the bioinformatics space. There are other spaces where we are seeing the same impact. 
I think the biggest problem in chemistry is a lot of the codes are really old because uh, they were written in the 70s and the 80s. In bioinformatics, which is much newer, you're much more uh, easily able to take advantage of things like AWS because your applications tend to be written in a more modern way. They tend to be you know, easier physics problems, quite honestly. And you can apply things like learning and machine learning and statistical approaches. So they're more cloud-friendly. But I think a lot of that is they started getting written in the 21st century. While in chemistry, the physics is difficult in many ways, but also the codes are much older. So there's a little bit of a transition. But realistically, as long as you can provide the right type of infrastructure and the applications work, more is always good. Smarter is also also better. Okay, Deepak. Well, thank you for being so generous with your time. It's been really great talking to you. No, I appreciate it. Uh, the fun conversation. DigitalOcean is a reliable, easy-to-use cloud provider. I've used DigitalOcean for years, whenever I want to get an application off the ground quickly. And I've always loved the focus on user experience, the great documentation, and the simple user interface. More and more people are finding out about DigitalOcean and realizing that DigitalOcean is perfect for their application workloads. This year, DigitalOcean is making that even easier with new node types. A $15 flexible droplet that can mix and match different configurations of CPU and RAM to get the perfect amount of resources for your application. There are also CPU-optimized droplets, perfect for highly active front-end servers or CI-CD workloads. And running on the cloud can get expensive which is why DigitalOcean makes it easy to choose the right size instance. And the prices on standard instances have gone down too. You can check out all their new deals by going to do.co slash sedaily. And as a bonus to our listeners, you will get $100 in credit to use over 60 days. That's a lot of money to experiment with. You can make $100 go pretty far on DigitalOcean. You can use the credit for hosting or infrastructure, and that includes load balancers, object storage. DigitalOcean Spaces is a great new product that provides object storage. And, of course, computation. Get your free $100 credit at do.co slash sedaily. And thanks to DigitalOcean for being a sponsor. The co-founder of DigitalOcean, Moisey Uretsky, was one of the first people I interviewed, and his interview was really inspirational for me, so I've always thought of DigitalOcean as a pretty inspirational company. So thank you, DigitalOcean. Wow! Wow!